Hello, craftspeople and corporatists. My name is TB's Kane, and it's putting it mildly to say that League of Legends has a lot of characters. If anything, it probably has too many and could stand to get rid of a few. But curiously, there's a certain kind of character that has always been missing. League of Legends has wizards and rogues and fighters and paladins. It has sorceresses and dragons and gnomes and pretty much every single other classic fantasy stable. But it has never had an old witch. Which is weird, right? The old witch is an absolute classic of fantasy and fairy tales. It's a foundational archetype. The old wise woman, the crone, the cackling granny at her cauldron. And yet, with more than 150 champions and over a decade of opportunity, not a single old witch to be found in League of Legends. It's an odd omission, isn't it? Strange that in a game that so happily uses so many fantasy archetypes that this one, this very basic one, should be missing for so long. To Riot's credit, though, when they finally did decide to play with the archetype, they had a really fun twist on the idea. Renata Glask is the witch with her cauldron, the old wise woman cooking up potions and brews, followed everywhere by her faithful familiar. But instead of expressing that archetype through medieval or mystical aesthetics, she is filtered through a thoroughly different lens and a much more modern one. Instead of an old crone at her cauldron, she's a cosmetics developer. Instead of cooking up potions and brews, she formulates chemical compounds. And instead of a black cat on her shoulder, she has a robotic servant decanter. It's a very clever twist on an old archetype, and it fills a unique space in the League of Legends roster. There's not a lot of other games out there that would ever let you play as this sort of character. She is one of my favorite additions to the League of Legends universe in a very long time, so... Eye of Newt and Toe of Frog, Wool of Bat and Tongue of Dog, Adder's Fork and Blind Worm's Sting, Lizard's Leg and Howlet's Wing, Double, Double, Toil and Trouble, Fire Burn and Cauldron Bubble, By the Pricking of My Thumbs, Someone Wicked This Way Comes. <laughs> To talk about Renata Glask's lore, first we need to talk about Piltover and Zaun. And to talk about Piltover and Zaun, we need to talk about class warfare. <laughs> If you've come into the League of Legends universe from Arcane, you already sort of have the gist of it, but as brutal as the oppression of Zaun is in Arcane, in the main League of Legends universe, it's actually even worse. Zaun was once the name of the whole city. It was a trading port straddling an isthmus between two seas and getting rich off the ships passing through its central river. The wealthy merchant class of Zaun eventually wanted to expand the river to increase the volume of trade and thus their profits, but their grand engineering project caused a horrifying series of industrial and mining disasters that permanently polluted the city and nearly sank half of it below sea level. Hoping to escape the ecological consequences, the rich built upwards, fleeing the toxins below into the sunlight above and in the process condemning the poor of the Undercity to lives in permanent darkness choking on the fumes and fallout. The shining city of progress rising above the pollution they called Piltover, while Zaun remained Zaun. It's worth understanding this because Zaun and Piltover are about on par with frickin' Midgar from Final Fantasy VII when it comes to extremely on-the-nose metaphors for class structure and inequality. And that metaphor is the central feature of the whole region. This is what Piltover and Zaun are about, and almost all of its champions are designed in some way to respond to these questions of class, wealth, and injustice that the cities struggle with. Which brings us to the story of Renata Glask. She was born poor to idealistic alchemist parents who spent more than they could afford on helping those who had nothing. Renata often went to bed hungry because of that and deprived. And like many people who are deprived, she dreamed of a better future, of luxury, of never again going hungry. And she dreamed of the vast sun gates of Piltover, the gates that control the flow of trade on the river. And she dreamed of sailing on the grand and wealthy ships that pass through them. Renata had no aptitude for chemistry, but she had a shrewd mind for business, and she reasoned that if her parents wouldn't charge the poor of Zaun for the medicine they needed, then hey, why not overcharge the wealthy instead? And because her parents were damn good alchemists, it worked. 
And it worked a little too well, because the rich bastards of Piltover took notice. The Glask family and their clinic was curing people of diseases, and this was inconvenient. Piltover's medical industry made its money selling chronic treatments, staving off disease but keeping people dependent on their products. And these potent new medicines from Zon, these cures, well, that would end the course of profitable diseases. They were a threat to the bottom line. So, the wealthy of Piltover sent enforcers to the Undercity. The cops bribed and paid off to murder the Glask family and burn their clinic to the ground. Renata lost her arm, trying to save her parents from the blaze. And there we have the class politics underlying the story. Renata grew up poor because her family spent everything they had trying to fight the effects of poverty in their community, and her parents were murdered because when Renata made the business successful enough to be an actual threat to continued inequality, the people profiting from inequality used institutional power of wealth and law enforcement to return the status quo to the normal that they prefer. Now, Renata is not radicalized by this into a based anti-capitalist labor organizer, but the psychology that drives her is animated by an intense resentment of the class structure of Piltover and Zahn. She recognizes that it was the wealthy of Piltover that destroyed her life and stole her family, and she is out for two kinds of revenge. First, there is the bloody kind. She plans to personally destroy the lives and legacies of the wealthy families of Piltover in revenge for what they've done. Secondly, she wants the poetic kind of revenge. She plans to beat them at their own game, to rise up from the Undercity and become the richest, meanest, most powerful queen bitch of capitalism that the world has ever seen, and thus grind the legacy of Piltover into the dust of history. And she has a very useful weapon in her arsenal to help her do that. See, Renata's parents invented a formula before they died, an incredibly powerful medicine, one so potent that it can nearly bring the dead back to life. That medicine was part of what made them so threatening to the medicinal industry of Piltover. Unfortunately, that medicine also had side effects. It made people violent, suggestible, psychotic, and even susceptible to mind control. And so her parents refused to use it as medicine. Renata, on the other hand, sees a very different potential for the compound. She builds herself up from practically nothing, purchasing loyalty from the destitute geniuses of Zon, and sets herself up as a new kind of chem baron. She makes products that are elegant, beautiful, artistic, precision calculated to appeal to the proclivities of Piltover's wealthy. She establishes herself as a lifestyle brand. Her products become marks of class and refinement, competing with and even outcompeting the techno-magical efficiency of Hextech by being sleeker, more refined, and ever more beautiful. And she launders her reputation, becoming trustworthy in the eyes of the city by engaging in philanthropy and charity, by throwing grand and decadent parties for the elite, and by generous application of gifts and bribes. But inside Every one of her products is a vial of her parents' formula, with all its mind-controlling and terrifying side effects ready to be unleashed on the wealthy classes of Piltover at Renata's signal. Every product she sells is another bomb planted on the foundations of the city's wealthy classes, and the nobility of Piltover are oh so eager to be her customers. And this is where we find Renata Glask in the current state of the lore, practically on the precipice of victory, simply biding her time until the moment is right for the grand reveal. Of course, her story isn't just a tale of justifiable revenge. There's another side to her narrative. In order for anyone to rise to the position that Glask has achieved, there are people that they have to step on. Rival wealthy chembarons, yes, but within the rigid class structure of Piltover and Zon, success demands not only that you climb over those who are above you, but that you stomp in the faces of those below you as well. As we know from Zeri's story, Renata's business involves her henchmen kidnapping vulnerable members of poor communities to get them out of the way of her construction projects. And those construction projects, as well as the mining necessary to secure raw material for her products, threatens the homes and lives of hundreds if not thousands of ordinary Zonites. She plays the role of philanthropist in public, but she engages in the exact same kind of brutality, the same exploitation of labor, and the same disdain for the poor that every other Kim Baron does. She states it herself pretty clearly in her voice lines. I love my city, but if I had to burn down Zaun to smoke out Piltover, well... When my parents handed out their cures, they asked for nothing. So we had nothing. 
kind, but foolish. I gave out breathers in exchange for Zon's loyalty. <laughs> Those dividends are priceless. Whatever kindness and compassion Renata Glask had died with her parents, and while she has understandable motivations, she's every bit as brutal and abusive to those she deems beneath her as every other Kim Baron in Zaun, and indeed, every noble industrialist in Piltover. Which is the thematic tension of her character. On the one hand, she's driven by profound resentment of Piltover, resentment of the class structure it has imposed, resentment of the cruelty and poverty that has been inflicted on Zaun, and resentment for what Piltover did to her family. On the other hand, she is in that structure now, and she helps to reinforce it. She has to, because without that structure to climb up inside of, she would never have her revenge the way she wants it. But it also muddies the distinction between her and the people she hates. Is she a righteous avenger striking a blow against the injustice of Piltover's oppression? Or is she just out to steal their position on top of the pile so she can be the boot doing the stomping? It's possible that even she doesn't quite know anymore. The way I read the character, this is her primary internal conflict. She's out for rebellion and revenge against Piltover for what it did to her, but everything she does also reinforces the power structure which Piltover used to do that to her. And analyzing her psychology a little bit, her embrace of wealth and power, her eagerness to take over rather than to dismantle the system, that seems to be at least in part a kind of rebellion against her parents. It seems motivated by resentment for the poverty and deprivation that they made her experience. She lost her arm trying to save them when she could have simply saved herself, but she also rejects their philosophies of altruism and selflessness as weakness, almost as though blaming them a little bit for how they died too. The ghosts of her parents haunt her, and they seem to be at the core of pretty much everything she does, for better and for worse. And indeed, when she dies on Summoner's Rift, there's a chance that the very last thing she says is... Finally, I can see them again. And that, to me, is really interesting. There's a tension in Renata that makes not just for a great villain, but for a great character. Renata is the very avatar of girl boss confidence, but she's also ultimately driven by a moment of profound disempowerment and fear. She lives her life in direct opposition to her parents' values, but she also loved them more than she has ever loved anyone else in her life. Every selfish thing she does for herself, she also does for them. Having said all that, I don't want to oversell Renata Glask's story. Like most champions in the game, and certainly champions released recently, the full sum of her narrative amounts to a biography and a single short story. It's a grand total of about 2,500 words worth of narrative, and the script to this video is going to be over three times longer than that. Which is one of Riot's persistent failures as stewards of their own universe. Their business is driven by a constant series of big releases of new things, and meanwhile the company's management systemically, and in my opinion incompetently, refuses to spend resources actually following through on the stories that they start. Renata Glask has one of the most compelling character psychologies in the entire game, she has the potential to be one of the great iconic villains of this entire franchise, and Riot Games, the corporation, can't find their own arse with both hands long enough to do anything with her. So for the love of God, my dear audience, I am begging you, someone please write this woman some fan fiction. <laughs> Renata Glask is a sharp dresser, and I mean that in the figurative sense, that outfit looks sleek, cool, and fashionable, and also in a much more literal sense. Because pay attention to the shape language here. The shoulders and collars are spiked, her hair is arranged in these triangular shapes, and her mask is a series of sharp angles and lines. The tie pin, her vest, her shoes, the embroidery on her trousers, everything about Renata Glask is sharp edges and pointy ends. Now, you can't build a human character entirely out of spikes and triangles. Some curves and circles and softness is inevitable, but there is a striking effort in Renata Glask's design to convey sharpness, to convey pointedness, to convey edges, and to reject all visual signifiers of softness and gentility. Her color scheme is primarily this very stark black and white arrangement, which again creates a sharpness in her look. There are very strong boundaries of contrast. The white streaks in her hair are almost 
carved into it. There's not a strand of it that's out of place. The black and white is used in contrast with each other, but it also contrasts with the bright burgundy of her shirt, which shares its colors with her eyes and with the chemtech liquid that flows through her arm. And that creates some visual storytelling. Here is a woman who has a sharp, stark, controlled exterior, but there is a colorful passion burning underneath. The fact that that bright burgundy color is both in her eyes and inside her arm also creates the implication that this color is her blood, which is thematically pretty damn potent for her. Because through that lens, her chemtech is her literal lifeblood. It's the legacy of her parents, the fuel of her vengeance, the expression of her rage and her bitterness and her ambition. Chemtech in League of Legends is generally identified with bright green because it's variously toxic and poisonous and radioactive. Renata's Chemtech is red in tone because it is angry, passionate, and violent, because it is her blood, because it is revenge for the spilling of her parents' blood. It's also, of course, practical for her gameplay. Red color tones are associated with passion and anger, and so it makes sense as the color scheme for a set of powers that can make you rage or go berserk. It works on both levels. Anyway, returning to the construction of her character design, she's also quite busty. She wears a vest that tightens around her midriff, which along with her bust and hips, gives her a very distinct hourglass shape, which in character design is one of the most common shorthands for femininity. Now, a bust is usually a source of roundness, softness, pliability, and something which I think is done quite cleverly here is that the designers have cut that softness with sharpness. The folds of her vest over the chest, both from in front and from above, overlap with her bust and convert its underlying round shape to triangular sharp edges, which has the double effect of maintaining her general aesthetic of sharpness, but also maintaining her aesthetic of femininity. If she had been flat-chested, for example, or hadn't had that vest creating the hourglass shape with her waist, her design would probably read as much more masculine or androgynous. And while she definitely has some butch energy, she is supposed to be a witch filtered through Dommy Mommy Devil Wears Prada CEO vibes, so cutting that balance, I think, is important for her. She wouldn't work in the same way in, say, a dress or pastel colors, but she also wouldn't work if she didn't read on site as specifically feminine. At least, I don't think so. Staying on the subject of gender, though, here's something very rare. A woman of visible middle age. Now, League of Legends has older women, but it has older women in the anime tradition. You know, the whole, she looks young, but she's actually a thousand years old. Camille is a classic example of this. She's supposed to be this stern, upper-class matron who's actually pushing 80, but her skin is porcelain smooth and her body is tight and fit like a 20-something because she has a Hextech heart, which prevents her from getting wrinkles for some reason. In characters like LeBlanc and Lissandra, we have these ancient magical matriarchs who have lived for centuries controlling entire societies and who could have easily and with some benefit been presented as older, but who are consistently depicted with that same smooth-faced 30-something youthfulness because, well, because Riot made up some reasons why they don't look old, even though it might benefit them to do so. Characters like Callista, Nidalee, Soraka, and Sona also have stories that fully support or would even benefit from a more mature or older presentation, but they all default to youth too, because youth is the default. It's not really an artistic decision, it's not meaningful, it's not interesting, it doesn't say anything about the characters or do anything for them, it's just easy, it's standard, it's unquestioned. This tendency applies to both male and female characters, of course, most of the men in the game are young too, and the outsized preference for youth in media is a well-documented phenomenon. But while Kratos's and Joel's and Nier's have become a familiar archetype of playable middle-aged sad dad, I would challenge you to name a AAA game with a middle-aged woman as a main character. Youth is fetishistically prioritized everywhere in media, but it's especially prioritized in the design of women. So obviously, Renata Glask is revolutionary. She's a bold strike against ageism in gaming, a statement of purpose that age should be no barrier to... She has, like, two wrinkles. There's some crow's feet if you zoom in on her eyes. She has some smile dimples. You can see visible geometry in her skin if you look closely, but it's not really represented in-game on her model. There's visible age, but it is modestly visible age. 
Now, she is supposed to be a cosmetics producer and a fashion lifestyle brand magnate. So yes, it makes perfect sense that this high-powered businesswoman would take care to visually preserve her youth. That is the aesthetic of power and social position in her story. And on the in-game model, subtle wrinkles and smile lines just aren't the kind of detail that's going to show up even if you were to add it. From the usual in-game perspective, it simply wouldn't be visible. Still, Renata is easily the oldest looking woman in the entire cast of League of Legends. She's the only time the game has actually engaged with the aesthetics of age on a woman, and she's the only time where they didn't make up an excuse, some magical reason why, even though it would make perfect sense to present her as older, wouldn't you just know it, some magic happened and now she looks young. In a broader context, it highlights just how hostile League of Legends as a whole has been to the idea of having any visible age on their female characters. Like, Silas is in his 30s, and he has lived a hard life, a life of pain and deprivation, and appropriately, it shows on his body. He looks like this. But here's Fiora, a woman in her 30s who's desperately trying to manage an ancient noble house and archaic city politics, as well as constantly engaging in a string of near-lethal duels. Here's Miss Fortune, a woman in her 30s, holding an entire city-state together with both hands, whose sleep is riddled with nightmares of her mom's murder and who routinely fights pirates and ghosts to the death. Here's Quinn, a wilderness scout in her 30s, whose entire life is spent hiking through rough country fighting monsters and battling Noxians. And here's Riven, a former child soldier whose entire life has been spent either in warfare, on hard field labor out in the sun with no sunscreen, or in gladiatorial combat. Their lives leave no mark on them. Hardships, struggle, weather, trauma, stress. Don't worry, there's not a wrinkle in sight on these women. Not a scar, not a blemish, not a pore on their perfect faces. From the perspective of visual storytelling, it's essentially as though their stories might as well not have happened to them at all. Age and aging is a tool. It's a trait that a character designer can use to tell you someone's history, to make a character distinct and memorable and unique and real. But pop culture in general, not just League of Legends, does a terrible job of using that tool. Instead, youth and the aesthetics of youth is a beauty ideal that we just sort of passively accept as desirable and good in and of itself and simply do not question. And commercially, perhaps all of this makes sense. Sex sells is the thought-terminating cliché that refuses to die. But creatively? Creatively, simply ignoring a character design tool like that is a failure, and kind of a pathetic one. And I do think that when a game has 100 million monthly players and profits in the billions, it is reasonable to demand better. What's the point of being so successful and profitable if you can't make the good artistic decision without worrying that you're not going to make enough money from it? And by the way, you don't need to head down into the comments to tell me that that's just business. Businesses need to make money and this makes money, so businesses need to do it because they're businesses and they're always going to do it, so there's no point complaining about it. My job as a critic isn't to shrug powerlessly in front of the status quo. My job is to at least attempt to articulate how things could be better and apathetic, disengaged nihilism is not the same as either realism or insight. Uh, anyway, I love Renata Glask and I love her character design. It's a genuine 9 out of 10 from me, a great job by Kindlejack and Prisma Prime, who I believe handle the concept art on this one. I just got sidetracked by the sheer weight of context around this particular character design. Good art will do that, by the way. Good art gets you talking, whether you like it or not, and Renata Glask is very good art to me. I've said many times before that an idle animation is a great opportunity to do characterization. How a character just stands around their mode of being in the world can be a great way to tell us something about their interiority. Zeri, for example, has a very fidgety, energetic idol. She's an electric champion, she's a young, enthusiastic girl, so that energy suits her. Renata, on the other hand, Renata barely moves. And this is a little bit unusual among League of Legends champions, actually, because oftentimes they have these quite exaggerated breathing animations to make sure that they look alive when viewed from the game's top-down perspective. Renata, though, and I really love this detail, I don't know if it's intentional, but I love it, she delegates her breathing cycle. She literally has a minion to do her breathing cycle for her. The idle floating up and down animation of her decanter does the job of giving her a visual breathing cycle, which allows her character model instead to be very 
still. And this gives her the vibe of being someone who is at ease in themselves. With that casual hand in her pocket, she looks comfortable and confident. She's not tense or nervous. She's not barely containing rage the way that Scion might do. She's just here, waiting for things to play out exactly the way she planned them. This attitude persists even into her idle animation when she has her gun out. You would expect that that might be more of a tense situation, but no, still very still, very composed. There's a slight added tension in the shifting of her hips and holding the gun raised, but this is not the posture of a woman who's nervous or worried about a goddamn thing. If you stand around for long enough, you do get a bit of movement from her. She pulls her hand out of her pocket, shifts her weight to the other hip, crosses her arms, and looks around with a certain air of impatience. It's as though someone was supposed to show up for a meeting and they're not here yet. And here we finally get a little bit of fidgeting. We get that flex of the prosthetic hand and then fingers drumming on her arm as she crosses them. Again though, it's not nervous or discomforted, it's just disappointed, mildly annoyed, impatient. It's the motion of someone who doesn't like having their time wasted, so again, that character is coming through. My favorite Renata animation, though, is probably her run. Or, well, not so much a run, because this is a capital P, capital W, power walk. It's almost a strut, actually, and that again conveys character, because this is not a normal walk, this is exaggerated, and in a very specific way. She doesn't walk, she strides. You can practically hear the loud clack, clack, clack of her heels on the floor of the office as she's headed to a high-powered CEO business meeting. It's the sound of, oh sh the boss is coming, look productive. As she walks, her hips have this huge sway too, gyrating and tilting from side to side, and just like the character design decision to give her a strong hourglass shape, this animation is about gender presentation. That exaggerated use of the hips, which we also saw somewhat in her idol poses, it all helps make her look more feminine. It's an aesthetic of movement that's associated specifically with feminine power. In conjunction with that, notice how much work is being done with the shoulders and the arms, how they rise and fall with her motion, indicating the weight and impact of her footfalls. These are just the principles of secondary motion and follow through in terms of animation, but it's being played up to heighten the visual impact of her movement. This is not the walk of a timid character. This is not the walk of someone who has something to hide. It's not the walk of someone who would prefer to go unnoticed. This is the walk of someone who owns this room, who owns the entire city, and who owns you. You. It's power walking. And speaking of power, That's right, motherfuckers, it is a JoJo reference. Renata Glask is a JoJo, and the decanter is her stand. <laughs> Being serious, though, her E animation and her ultimate both feature poses that ripped straight out of Hirohiko Araki's sensibilities, playing visually for maximum impact. And this kind of matters to her storytelling, actually, because, yeah, it's the decanter acting, but it's her order to act that is the source of power, her command, her gesture. So it matters that the posing of her is as powerful as possible. It prevents the machine from taking over as the thing that has power and agency. It keeps her visually in charge. And besides that, it's also just, like, clever, isn't it? Because isn't that the whole point of her kit? Renata Glask doesn't do anything. She has people and things to do it for her. When she uses her W on you, you are her JoJo stand. And when she pops her ult, so is everyone else. She delegates, she commands, she orders. And the visual aesthetic of wildly exaggerated JoJo poses are a great way to communicate that part of her story and character. Uh, anyway, let's end on a lighthearted note and examine a detail from her dance animation. The first thing you'll notice about her waltz with the decanter is that she's the one who's leading. That's obvious, of course she is, it would be ridiculous if she wasn't. And a waltz is a good choice, it has connotations of power and prestige, it's the kind of dancing that we tend to associate with monarchy and nobility and elegance and sophistication and the upper crust and so on and so on. But the detail that I love is how she initiates the dance, because she bows gracefully to the decanter, it reaches out an arm and then yoink! There's no delicate acceptance of the partner's hand here. There's no gentle embrace of the other for an expression of passion and music. She's fully like, 
dragging her partner into her chest, putting them off balance so she can lead. And again, the character vibes of the storytelling here are just perfect. I can just imagine that she drags some poor noblewoman into her arms at a piltover ball like, follow my lead and we'll both look good. Now let's get this over with. It's forceful, it's impatient, it's controlling, and for Renata Glask, it is amazing. Anyway, before we move on, I have to do the other necessary part of my job for a second and self-promote. So, hey, uh, subscribe to the channel if you want to. If you think the video is good, please do click the like button because it actually genuinely helps me. And if you want to support the work that I do, I have a Patreon and a coffee page where you can sign up to support the channel monthly or send me a one-time tip. There are some rewards you can get for that, like early access to these videos and access to special rooms in the channel Discord. A $1 donation equates to the ad revenue of thousands, if not tens of thousands of views on YouTube. So if there is a YouTuber whose work you love, whether it's me or someone else, consider supporting them with what you can, when you can. It makes so much more of a difference than you think. Thank you. Renata Glask's story is going to play out the way that a villain's story always does. Either her plan works, or else it is foiled. If it is foiled, well, it's easy to imagine how it'll happen. It'll be some combination of Vi and Caitlyn doing police work and Zeri and Echo doing plucky, rebellious teenager stuff to undermine her from below. Maybe Seraphine is there, maybe you get cameos from Jace and Victor, and yeah, I don't know, maybe Heimerdinger helps Echo build a science contraption that helps them ruin her plans somehow. But beyond the details, it will play out as the foiling of villains almost always does. Our heroes will figure out her plan in the 11th hour, there will be a desperate scramble to stop its execution, and then right at the end when all seems lost, some fatal flaw in her thinking will give the heroes the opportunity they need to save the day. And that kind of resolution can be exciting and a lot of fun, but it would ultimately be the hero's story. It would be about Echo and Zeri's love for their impoverished communities, it would be about Caitlyn and Vi's determination to hold the powerful to account, or Seraphine's idealistic wish to bring the people of the two cities together. It would be about those things, and it would use Renata's selfish drive for power and revenge as a contrasting opposite to demonstrate the virtue of the hero's cause. It would be fun, but it wouldn't be Renata Glask's story. So let's turn to the other option. Let's imagine that Renata wins. She plants her vials of chemtech mind control gas in every major noble house in Piltover, and one by one they begin to fall. Some of the houses see their masters and mistresses die in sudden accidents or a spate of unexplainable suicides. Some of them enter bad business deals that by rights they should have been too smart to fall for, and their assets are acquired by subsidiaries of Glask Industries. And once it's clear which way the wind is blowing, the rest of them, out of fear or self-preservation or some vain belief that they can turn the situation to their advantage, well, the rest of them just fall in line. Camille realizes what Glask is doing but can't act because Glask has the loyalty of too many of the remaining hereditary noble houses. Caitlin has circumstantial evidence of everything Glask has done but no smoking gun with which to charge her under the law. There are skirmishes and sabotage in Zaun where some plucky urchins from the streets liberate their neighborhoods from Renata's control and she lets them have it because they mean nothing to her now that the shining city of Piltover is within her grasp. There's no revolution, no bloody-handed storming of the gates, no. The keys to the city simply fall into her possession by contract. Her people sit on the High Council, her bribes grease the wheels of commerce, and the Sun Gates finally belong to her. Her prophecy comes true. Sooner or later, everyone works for Renata Glask. She tears down the old mansions of families she particularly detests. A few well-placed bribes ensure that the houses are accused of having rot in their foundations that must be cleared. Others she turns into orphanages, hospitals for the needy, community centers, or, her favorite, residential housing for the poorest of Zaun. Not out of a sense of altruism, of course, but because there is no insult so profound to the noble scumbags of Piltover as seeing the poor derive benefit from their property. Renata Glask sees Piltover die before her, melting into Zaun as she opens voids in the class structure which the city of glass and mirrors rushes up to fill. Some decry it as vandalism against tradition, some ecstatically cheer it as the coming of a new age of prosperity, but it matters little to Renata. What matters is that the city of progress and all of its pompous self-regard is crumbling, swept away with a single wave of her hand.
she's in her new office, a shining marvel of taste and design, constructed in the highest tower in Piltover. The last golden rays of a sunset are pouring in from the balcony, trailing languidly across her desk. It belonged to the former head of the council, and the desk is built from the hull of the first ship to ever cross through the sun gates. She stares at the paperwork in front of her, the thousandth acquisitions contract she's signed in a month. It's a funny thing, wealth, it's almost magnetic. The more of Piltover's business she acquires, the more of it comes crawling to her begging for a big buyout. It's all rats fleeing a sinking vessel, rich cowards worried that it'll cost more to resist her than they would stand to gain from winning the fight. They're right, of course, but they're no less the cowards for it. She has read the contract carefully a dozen times. She reads everything carefully. But her legal team is bulletproof and loyal to the point of death. On pain of death, there is not a comma out of place. She puts the pen to the dotted line and pauses. The sunlight seeps over the contours of fine art and antique furniture in the office, every piece of decor and every decoration worth twice what a zonite would earn in a lifetime. They are all spotless, clean, and unused. They are not here to be looked at or sat in or enjoyed. They are here to be expensive and intimidating. Renata looks at a modern art monstrosity situated across from her desk. It's a wild abstraction of shapes in marble and brass, twisted into the caricature of a burning fire. It's a sculpture by some dead Piltovan genius. He had died young, she remembers, from some incurable disease, and it had driven the price of his work through the roof. She bought it from an auction catalog on the title alone, Reckoning. It seemed right for a pretentious office centerpiece. She scoffs and turns her attention back to the contract, rereading the final paragraph a thirteenth time. As she reads, the fading sunlight catches the brass on the statue and it twinkles in her eye. She moves her head and the chaotic divots hammered into the brass cause the light to flicker and dance across her face. The room is lighting up now with the reflections carving the shape of flames into the office walls. She reaches up to block the miserable light, and as the prosthetic hand rises in front of her eyes, the undulating orange light spills between her fingers, and she sees her mother's face in the flames, wide-eyed and terrified. Her father is already dead on the floor, but she is still alive, choking on the fumes. There's a wall of fire and burning debris between them. She's shouting for Renata to run, but... Renata has the medicine, vials of the formula. She was studying it. It can stave off anything. She's seen it pull bones together in seconds. It can save them too. She tears it out of her pocket and pours it into her mouth and punches at the burning plaster. Her skin boils on contact and the fire catches her jacket sleeve, but she heaves back and punches again and again, hearing the charred board give way as ice-cold medicinal madness rises from her stomach. She doesn't see her veins turn burgundy, but she feels the skin on her hands sear and regenerate and sear again as she tears at the wall, and it finally gives way. She reaches in through the gap, reaches for her mother's hand. If she can just pull her through fast enough, there's a crack and a crash, and suddenly the whole wall gives way, and the room collapses like folded paper. Beams and floorboards crush around her arm, and everything becomes fire and light and pulsing purple, agonizing hatred, and she screams and screams and... Miss Glask! Her secretary, Raymond, swims into view in front of her eyes, choking as her prosthetic hand tries to throttle him. He's pinning her hand against the desk. It's holding her gun. Miss Glask, it's Raymond. It's only me. His voice is strained, but steady, and he keeps his grip on the gun. She hadn't hired him just for paperwork. She blinks against the burgundy haze and feels tears pouring out from under her eyelids. They leave glowing trails down her cheeks. With a start, she releases Raymond and holsters the gun hurriedly, almost a little embarrassed, and wipes the liquid off her face. Third time this month, ma'am, says Raymond, levelly. Yes, I can count to three, Raymond. I meant should I get the dog? No, she snaps a little too forcefully. No, no, that won't be necessary. She swipes up the contract on the table and hands it off to him. See that this is filed and approved by the usual means. Then leave. I have no more need of you tonight. Right you are, ma'am. Raymond never argues. It's one of his qualities. He takes the paper, folds it once, and leaves. Renata stands at the window by her balcony and stares at the last slivers of the sun as it sets. 
When the door clicks shut behind her, she exhales, and her shoulders fall, and her prosthetic arm starts to shudder. She clutches at it, wheezing against the doorframe of the balcony, and collapses slowly onto her knees. Her arm is on fire. The flames are tearing at the flesh, and she remembers the scent of burning skin so vividly that it makes her wretch. She punches at the metal prosthetic, which shudders limply under the blow. She hits it again and again and again, knowing it won't replace the burning with any other kind of pain, but trying it anyway out of sheer bloody-minded resistance to her other urge. Eventually, she gives in. She reaches up with a shaking hand to her earring and dislodges it from its clasp. She tears the top off the tiny gem with her teeth and pours its contents into her mouth. Icy cold spreads through her throat, into her stomach, and slowly, so much more slowly than it used to, it works its way into her shoulder, into her arm, and quenches the burning degree by degree. She sees her eyes glow bright burgundy in the reflection of the balcony window, and dark veins spiraling out under her skin as the formula takes effect. It has been refined a lot since she was young. The finest chemtech engineers in Zon have pored over the composition, adding this compound and subtracting that, cutting the liquid with painkillers and esoteric enzymes. It is less addictive now, less toxic, and less dangerous to the nervous system. Less. Her prosthetic arm trembles and shakes a few more times. Its electrochemical prongs reconnect with the nerves in her shoulder, and it comes awkwardly back to life. She flexes it a few times and feels nothing. Behind her, a piece of the brass crumbles off the sculpture. The marble is riddled with bullet holes. On an otherwise unremarkable day in late summer, an otherwise unremarkable guard at the Piltover airship docks has a remarkable amount of money shoved into his hands. All he has to do is not log the departure of a single ship, and then the money is his. What fool would say no? A single small dirigible, sleek and gorgeous, fresh off the line of the former Pharaoh's ironworks, glides through the Piltover sun gates, past the Glass Industries logo embossed into the brass, and out towards the open sea. Up from Piltover below comes the sound of shouting and fighting as a contingent of wardens led by the sheriff and her pet enforcer confront the private security of Piltover's remaining councilmen. The newspapers are flooded with headlines about corruption, bribery, and scandal, new information released from unnamed sources, and the streets are starting to get thick with angry citizens. Smoke rises up from one particularly affluent part of town as firefighters' sirens begin to blare over the din. The dirigible glides over it all, almost lazily, as though taking in the chaos and the mounting carnage. Zeppelins and merchant ships begin to overtake it, its occupants fleeing from the unrest or from the law, and police ships are following after firing harpoons while wardens shout for surrender through megaphones. Deep below, in Zon, in a murky alley behind a steelworks, Echo hammers a plaque into the wall. Hey, this look good enough? He asks, looking back. Seraphine gives him a cheerful thumbs up while Zeri just shrugs. He hops down off the ladder and looks back up at it. It's just a simple plate of brass with a few words of commemoration. In memory of Tia and Omran Glask. Do you know who they are? He asks. Eh, my grandma said they used to be doctors around here. Zeri shrugs. I guess they were her family or something. Echo shuffles a bit awkwardly. Are we supposed to, I don't know, put down flowers? Nah, the deal was just for the plate. It's a plaque, chirps Seraphine. Plate? Sari punches her shoulder playfully. And that's it. No more Kim Barons in our turf. Echo scratches the back of his neck. I I kind of feel like there should be flowers. Zeri rolls her eyes, but Seraphine grabs her by the arm. Oh, come on! I know a great shop just down the road. They have all the colors. And the three of them vanish down the alleys, laughing and joking as they go. The dirigible pulls to a stop in the air, bobbing in the wind over the mouth of the river Pilt as it disgorges into the Guardian Sea. Renata Glask leans on the railing and stares out east. The Great Barrier Mountains and the Noxian frontier are to the north and beyond that, Ionia. To the south, Shurima and its civil war, and to the east, the Reaver port of Bilgewater. Back in Piltover, she knows, Raymond and her staff must be frantically searching for her. So many things they need her to sign. It'll be less than a month, she thinks, before Glask Industries disintegrates into infighting, and decades before the lawsuits are resolved. 
The fallout will be spectacular, especially once they find out what she did with all the money. She laughs. But first, she says to no one in particular, what is it the sailors say? For the tithe? And with a flick of her wrist, she throws the thing that she's holding overboard. The finest Hextech engine money can buy roars to life as she grabs the controls and pushes hard. The dirigible accelerates slowly until, with a sudden burst of blue light, it kicks forward and vanishes into the horizon. Moments later, in the ocean below, a finely crafted prosthetic arm breaks the surface of the water, and trailing a veil of bubbles, it sinks quietly into the dark. Well, that's one suggestion, anyway, on how Renata Glask's story might shake out. I think one of the things that's so compelling about her is that tension of what it's all really for. Why put so much of herself into winning this game of wealth? Does she just want to be rich? I think her psychology ultimately comes down on revenge. Revenge for her parents and revenge for the poverty she was forced to grow up in. I think that was the point of being successful. That was the point of taking over. It's not about being rich so much as it's about becoming rich as a form of victory over everyone who's ever held her down. Once she wins, I think the wealth and the power and the politics, that's not really going to serve her anymore. It doesn't really get her anywhere towards any ambition. It just becomes baggage. And I don't think she's actually that interested in it. The thing that she dreamed of as a child was taking a ship through the sun gates and from there out into the world. And I think once everything else is dealt with, once she's gotten what she wants, that will be the last thing that matters to her. And yeah, she gets away scot-free in this version of events. She's not made to answer for all the people that she's hurt and all the terrible things that she's done. Because, well, this is her victory scenario. Probably she will try and settle down somewhere, maybe in the Noxian-occupied Ionia, but I don't think she'll be able to really keep her head down. Eventually she'll be pulled into running some sort of dubiously ethical business. I don't know, maybe she'll run an arena for set or something. But eventually age and injury and the side effect of her chemtech will catch up with her, and then that'll be that. I don't think she'll have a particularly glorious or noteworthy end or any kind of a redemption arc. I think her revenge on Piltover will be the climax of her life, and everything after that will be surfing down the side of the tsunami she caused. But hey, that's just my idea for where her story could go. We'll see if Riot ever get around to try and tell it better than I did, but if you have any other ideas, do let me know in the comments, or better yet, write it into fanfiction. There is so much I love about Renata Glask. I love the cohesiveness of her character design. I love the verve and confidence of her animation, and I love her JoJo poses. I love her as a villain. I like her as a horribly problematic anti-hero, and it's just so f nice to finally have an older woman witch archetype in this godforsaken franchise. I've been asking for it for a decade. Renata Glask is unique, both in League of Legends and in the wider landscape of gaming. Which is not to say that she's flawless, and obviously, maybe her gameplay has some problems. I never comment on that. But I do think that, on the whole, as a thematic piece of the game, the developers at Riot knocked this one out of the goddamn park. Characters like this are why I can't drop this stupid video game. This is why I can't get away from League of Legends. There's so much about this IP that is handled terribly. There's so much dumb garbage, there's so much CEO meddling and mismanagement, and there are entire years of no development in the story. But then also sometimes they release Arcane, or Ruined King, or the Ash War Mother comic. Sometimes they release Renata Glask, and it makes me consider, just for a second, trying one more game of Summoner's Rift Normals. I won't, though, of course, I resist. I, I definitely, um, I definitely, definitely won't. Hey, thanks for watching another What's the Deal With? Renata Glask is one of the more exciting champion releases the game has had in a long time, at least for me, and I am genuinely a big fan of her entire deal. As ever, my biggest criticism is my full expectation that Riot will not do anything interesting with her, especially in the aftermath of Arcane, which Riot now seems to plan to pivot their entire IP around, which I have some opinions on that plan. And like, because of Arcane, I think Renata is just going to be sidelined as being like too similar to Silco, who did inspire a bunch of her character, and that just kind of 
sucks because there's a great character there. I just wish I saw any potential that something will be done with her. Which is why I am taking refuge in fanfiction. I can develop almost any headcanon I want, and, like, what's Riot gonna do about it? Release stories for underserved champions? Ha! <laughs> I think I'm safe. Anyway, I have already shilled for the Patreon, so I guess I should just tell you to check out my Twitch channel. I stream Final Fantasy XIV over there at the moment, and Final Fantasy XVI, Tears of the Kingdom, and The Song of Nunu Game are almost certainly also going to be streamed there. You can check out my Let's Play channel, 2 B's Guide, for stream VODs and general Let's Plays, and of course I upload new short videos every single day over on TB's Guide Shorts. And that's that. Remember to be kind to one another. Have solidarity with those who are worse off than yourselves, and may the tides of history wash gently over us all. Thank you.